Yeah, okay, welcome everybody. Um, so in the next 25, 30 minutes, uh, I will be talking about maximizing the productivity of your security operations center using UEBA and SOAR, now UEBA standing for User and Entity Behavior Analytics, and SOAR meaning Security Orchestration, Automation and Response. And like mentioned, my name is Sander Bakker, I'm the Sales Manager for Logarithm in Northern Europe. So before we dive in, uh, I would like to start actually with a quote. And the quote is as follows. Um, it's not a question of if your organization will be breached. It is all about how long it will take to discover it, right? Um, we need to realize that organizations get broken into. And when they get broken into, it, it is of the utmost importance that we reduce the mean time to detect and mean time to respond. Um, so how well are we doing? Well, at the moment, the dwell time, so the time that an attacker sits on an organization's network or infrastructure before he's actually being discovered, sits at about 56 days, according to the 2020 Mendiant report. And that is a very, very long time. Although we are getting better, right? In 2019, this was um, 78 days and uh, 2000 and the year before that it was 101 days so we are getting better but it is still way too long and and why is it important to reduce that dwell time well for instance if we could reduce the dwell time to about seven days then the business impact of a breach of that attack will be reduced by 77 percent now if we are able to reduce it to just one day, right, the impact um, we can reduce with 96%. So as you can see, reducing the dwell time is of the utmost importance. And um, we need to do that by you know, reducing the mean time to detect and mean time to respond. So we can greatly reduce that business impact. So why haven't organizations been able to do so before? And what's troubling them? Well, first of all, it is alarm fatigue, right? Your team is struggling to keep up with the thousands uh, of alarms and alerts coming out of your existing security posture on a day-to-day -day basis. The security team is being bombarded and they have no idea how to prioritize their time, right? And even worse, they don't know how to distinguish real threats from false positives. And they have you know, thousands or hundreds, uh, ten thousands of these false positives they need to look up uh, at on a monthly basis, according to IDC, um, where IDC says 37% of cybersecurity professionals report facing 10,000 alarms per month, of which 52% are false positives. So the security analysts, the security team members need to look at all of these alarms and most of them are false positives. And while they're looking at these false positives, th there's a high chance that they miss the real threats in there. And as they're working these false positives, they might get bored looking at all the same threats all the time, which are actually not a threat. So you have a danger of what we call bore out and the alarm fatigue will lead to burnout. So we have a lot of stress in the security team within security operation centers. Now you might say, okay, then we add people to the mix. So we just hire additional people to solve the issue. Well, the problem is, is that we have a major talent shortage, right? It is estimated that there are over 2.9 million unfulfilled cybersecurity positions worldwide. So it's very difficult to find skilled personnel. So organizations are struggling to find them, uh, to retain them, to expand them. And, uh, you know, if you find these people, it takes about five, six months for them to come up to speed. And because of this, let's say, alarm fatigue, boredom, uh, looking at false positives, you know, the chance that they leave uh, within two, three years is very high. So and that's another problem. Now, the third problem that we have is lack of automation. Without automation, your team needs to do everything manually, 
right? Meaning that they can handle fewer investigations and a single incident can be very time consuming. So this is very labor intensive, time consuming. It doesn't scale very well. And uh, what you actually need to do, you need to uh, create automation as much as possible because automation allows complex tasks and workflows to be performed at scale without human intervention so that security teams can protect dynamic environments against fast moving threats. Yeah, think of ransomware. You know, ransomware attacks can be very fast and you need to automate as much as possible if you want to protect yourself against these type of attacks. And then last, you know, there is very the issue of fragmented workflows. So some things get followed up, other things do, do not get followed up. And this is because there is no formalized way of handling things. And, you know, team members can have their own way of doing things using tools like email or spreadsheets or Google Docs and not really collaborating with the other team members. So that doesn't scale. And um, it could end up that uh, threats do not get detected. They slip through the, through the cracks and are forgotten. Uh, because your team lacks that centralized workflow and uh, case management system. So these are some of the problems that we are facing. So what can we do about it? Uh, how can we improve? Now, I want to focus on um, about four areas. First of all, I'm going to talk about or dive into targeted analytics and more specifically the user. Then, you know, what is important is risk-based alarming or risk-based prioritization of your threats in your environment. And then, of course, you need to improve your workflows, formalize your workflows and automate those workflows as much as possible. The process, automate the process, but also automate the response to the threat in your environment. So, I want to focus here on the user. Why the user? Because users in all of these InfoSec studies show that they are a major source of concern, right? And if we look at the statistics, 69% of organizations reported recent insider data exfiltration attempts. So this is serious. 28% uh, of breaches involved internal actors. And what is the most frightening thing? 91% um, of firms report inadequate insider threat programs. So although the user and insiders are a major concern, they have no way of understanding or finding out what is actually happening on the inside. So what to do? Now, what are some of these yeah, wide range of user-based threats that we need to have a look at? Well, first of all, you have your common insider threats. So these are rogue employees, criminal actors, uh, saboteurs, accidental actors. And um, according to a study from Gardner, uh, about 69% of them uh, actually do this because of financial motive, uh, right? They want to have a second source of income. Uh, another big issue is uh, employees taking intellectual property with them. About 29% um, uh, of, of employees do this. And, and that is very, very, well, let's say, uh, detrimental for an organization. Uh, to give you an example, a famous example is Anthony Lewandowski. So he was a security engineer or a engineer that worked on the self-driving car within Google. Now, um, he decided to leave Google and to start his own company, his own company called Auto Trucking. Um, now, he started that company and that company was then acquired by Uber. And now um, Google is suing Uber for um, intellectual property infringement because of the intellectual property that um, Lewandowski took from Google. And the damages that they're seeking is 2.6 billion. So serious money. Um, another, let's say, inside a threat or user-based threat is compromised accounts, right? Which can happen through malware, um, but it can also be because, you know, um, hackers or, or, or attackers impersonate users. 
And the third, let's say, category is privilege account use and misuse. And this quite often uh, is or are convenience seekers, right? They have the opportunity and they, you know, capture the opportunity um, because, you know, it is possible. So how to solve the issue? Well, there are basically four critical steps for effective UEBA. And we need to start essentially with optimizing our data, right? optimally preparing our data. We need to receive raw data so we know who's doing what, where and when and how, so we can baseline the organization. So we need to collect the data, we need to uh, classify the data, we need to contextualize the data, we need to normalize the data so we can work with it. And of course, we need to have the identity associated with it, uh, either directly or it needs to be inferred. So have a best guess of who this is. So identity needs to be added. And then once we have that, we need to identify the anomalies. And that can, can be done through what we call scenario-based analytics, but it can also be done through what we call behavioral profiling or behavioral analytics. And preferably we could use the bo uh, both of them in combination. Now, once we found the, the threats, we have determined the threats, then we need to um, understand, okay, what is, uh, let's say the impact of this threat to my organization? What is the urgency of additional investigation and, and response? In other words, we need to give every threat a risk score on a scale of a one to of a zero to a hundred. So we know at what threats we need to look at first. And then of course we need to solve the issue as well. So this is where SOAR comes into play. But as everything starts with um, the data. So we need to receive the data. We need to give the data a uniform data schema, a common classification. Um, we need to give it true time. So we know in what sequence things have occurred true identity, we need to have true host, true app, true geo, so we know where the threat is coming from. And uh, basically, you know, we need to create a uh, fast structure of finding, let's say, events or threats in all of the data. Now, the way that we organize things is we take the log messages and we bring them back into what we call common events. And we support about 850 different vendors right out of the box, meaning about 700,000 different log messages, which we bring back to about 30,000 common events and about 39 classifications. Now this makes it a very quick search structure, but at the same time, it allows us to swap out different messages, log messages. So if you have, let's say um, a firewall uh, a checkpoint firewall or and you swap it out for a checkpoint firewall, the specific log messages will change, but the common event will, will remain the same and your classification will remain the same. So it's easy to work with, you know, within your environment. So once we have optimized the data, then we need to understand the actual identity of the user. Um, and, and here is where true identity comes in. Now, I already mentioned true identity. Why is that important? Well, um, persons or users can be known on the network or in the infrastructure under different account identifiers, right? They can be known in Active Directory as Mobius slash G Smith, in GitHub as Lone Star or personal email, gsmith78 at gmail.com. Now, why is it important to bring all of this back to one identity? Well, if you have, for instance, here a Windows event where Mobius slash G Smith logged into a certain domain, and at the same time following that, you have an endpoint log showing that G Smith, different account identifier, had a file access. And then you see that in the network logs that gsmith78 at gmail.com uh, logged into Dropbox, you see that this is actually an exfiltration attempt. And because you're bringing all of these account identifiers back to one identity, his true identity, you're able to see this. So true identity is very important. Another important thing to realize is that 
attacks sit on a spectrum and require different analytics uh, way, ways of doing analytics. Um, to, now to explain that a little bit, right? On one end, you have attacks where the vulnerability is known and the method is known. Um, in the middle, you have vulnerabilities known, methods unknown. And to the right, you have vulnerabilities unknown, methods unknown. So, you know, known attacks or known ways of brute forces, uh, commodity malware. And to the right side, you have the zero days uh, attacks and the insider threats. And to analyze or to find these threats, you need to have different technologies, right? So the known, let's say, threats you can find with scenario-based analytics. You can find them very quickly, very easily, um, you know, within microseconds. Um, the unknown threats you can only find using what we call behavioral profiling or behavioral analytics. So let's have a closer look at these. Now, what do we mean with scenario analytics? Well, scenario analytics means that, uh, you know, um, an event A is happening, then event B, and then an event C. And, you know, the sequence of it indicates that there is a threat being executed or um, a scenario which is aligned with the cyber attack lifecycle. So, for instance, we might have multiple lockouts on a host, right? So this could be an indication that there is reconnaissance going on. Now, then there might be an initial compromise. So there might be an authentication. And, okay, that means that the actual risk of this scenario is increasing. And then there might be a command and control established and there will be current, concurrent connections to that one host. Maybe there's lateral movement, brute forces into other hosts, and then maybe abnormal file access. And as this scenario progresses, the risk and the priority of this threat needs to go up. So that is one. And the other way of doing things is using what we call behavior analytics or behavioral profiling. And this is where what we call artificial intelligence, the wider, let's say, a subject, but more specifically machine learning comes into play. A way you can use supervised machine learning or unsupervised machine learning to basically learn the environment, taking large data sets and, you know, find out of you know, what the user is doing, what is the normal pattern, right? Who is doing what, where, and when, but not only for the user himself, but also how he compares to others. So you need to group these users in what we call peer groups, so you can have peer group deviation and notify that on that as well. So as soon as he starts, you know, changing his own behavior, but also if he's changing his behavior compared to others in his grouping, so the benefits of machine learning are, of course, well, you do, can do that pattern learning. Um, you can have that anomaly recognition and you can have predictive capabilities. Now we at Logrhythm uh, have, of course, this implemented in our environment uh, in different manners. So you can do it on-prem or you, know, you can also do it in the cloud uh, using a technology, what we call cloud AI. Why do we also do this in the cloud? Because if you want to do this long-term, um, you need to have a lot of compute, a lot of storage, a lot of scalability, and it's easier to do to scale in the cloud than on-prem. So, you know, the choice is up to our customers, but, you know, we have both available. Um, and like you see here, this is you know, one of our dashboards where you see the user distribution where on the left, you know, the green, uh, everybody's okay. And to the right, you have these outliers, very red. And to the bottom left, you see the top anomalous users. Um, for instance, Dylan Matthew uh, with a score of 93. And also, we also see Ed Carolyn with a score of 92. We can also see the top anomalous events, etc. Now we can drill into these users to find out why they scored this high. So, for instance, if we zoom in into Ed, we see that there's, uh, you know, in the last hour, a large distance between locations, uh, 263 miles observed from where he logged into. So normally he logs in from his home situation or from the office, and now he's somewhere completely different. 
um, there can be unusual number of locations or uh, unusual volume of failed authentications, etc. Or it can even be a number of un uh, unusual um, amounts of volumes of pages printed. Right, anything that could be an indication that he's not behaving like he should be behaving. And it doesn't mean that this is a threat, it's just an indication that you know needs to be investigated. And you can start your investigation using the case icon to the right, uh, the suitcase. Um, now, once we have detected those threats, right, um, and we are reducing the mean time to detect then we also need to reduce the mean time to respond. And this is where SOAR comes in, where we need this centralized visibility and command. We need to enhance our staff productivity. We need to measure and manage the SOC. And we need to, of course, reduce the false alarms and false positives. So when we look at logarithm uh, specifically, right, the key SOAR capabilities that we think that are needed are an integrated case and incident management system and using playbooks. So once there is, let's say, a case created, you can add a playbook. So you have a standardized way of solving issues. Second, you might have or you might need what we call a smart response automation. So this is automatically responding to threats in your environment. Could be reconfiguring a port on a switch, could be reconfiguring the firewall, could be uh, quarantining a user on the network. And then you can also have uh, maybe integration with other tools or um, tools like uh, well, ITSM, like ServiceNow or BMC Remedy. Or maybe you want to add additional context and you want to um, integrate with a threat intel provider using sticks and taxi. And then, of course, uh, it's very important to keep your metrics, your security effectiveness metrics. Now, this SOAR um, workflow, uh, you know, follows a certain, let's say, uh, process. And of course, you get your threat detection. Then you need to create a case. It can be automated or it can be done you know, from any um, screen with just one click. Then you need to start investigating, following a certain playbook, add all the details, log data, notes, etc. maybe add a collaborator, and then of course do the mitigation and response, eliminating, you know, the threat. Now, with that, in our environment, that means that you will be, you know, uh, getting a alarm scorecard. And this alarm card will show you what kind of threat it is, the risk this threat has. You know, it's also bright red. If it's very high, it also shows you there are three smart responses uh, and they can be executed uh, automatically if you want to do so. Now, if you want to know more about this, let's say alarm, then everything, all the details are available in an inspector pane. And then you can add the playbook on how to solve this. And playbooks are important because it allows an organization to share knowledge, right? You can create your own playbooks uh, where a experienced analyst, you know, um, creates a playbook so that also a junior analyst can handle, you know, these cases. And then of course, you can automatically um, automate the, um, or have it manually respond to a threat. Uh, in this case, resetting the password for an Active Directory account. So smart response automation can be multiple ways. It can be a workflow action. So automatically starting a vulnerability scanner it can be contextual, looking up an IP address domain, etc., with a threat intel provider, or it can be a remediation action uh, that can be automatic, it can be after an approval, or it can be uh, analyst triggers triggered and you have hundreds of these actions available uh, like I already mentioned reconfiguring a firewall quarantining a user etc now <clears throat> what is also very important is that uh, source should be measurable right we need to keep track of all time the time to three hours time to qualify time to investigate etc why is that important? because we need to understand how we can improve our security posture, our security operation center, and where we need to make our 
investments. So this will give us a roadmap if we need to invest in people, if we need to invest in technology, or if we need to uh, invest in process. So coming to basically, you know, the end of, of my talk, um, in summary, key takeaways, uh, you need to leverage UEBA and advancements in machine learning to automate you know, the detection of threats in your environment. And then you need to add uh, risk-based prioritization to these threats. So you know what threats to look at first. And then you need to automate as many tools and tasks as possible, right? So you can increase the productivity by leveraging that automation. You need to focus on integration and automatic, automatic responses. So reconfiguring that file automatically, quarantining that, that use automatically, revoking that password automatically. So you won't get that call at three o'clock in the morning if you, you, know, you need to come to the office to solve an issue. The system can solve that issue for you and you come in at nine o'clock and okay, the case was created. Okay, you review and it's done. And then last, you know, like I mentioned, you need to have the metrics to drive your roadmap and investments, right? So you need to understand based on these metrics, if you need to invest in people, in process or in technology. Um, now I wanna leave it at this. Um, any questions?